it's a joy to see all of you. I can't see everybody, but I, I, I think there's more people on than I can see. I'm just going to say, obviously, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited that our community monitoring project has be, finally begun collecting data. This Zoom is only an introduction to the data collection. We want to make sure everyone knows what is happening and have a preliminary look at what we are seeing in the data. We have Wilma Subra and Dr. Slava Luminiki with us to discuss the data and answer your questions. If anyone on the Zoom would like to schedule a follow-up discussion to do a deeper dive into data specific to their area, please reach out to us and we'll coordinate that individually. Okay, someone has already reached out, so that's great. Yeah. To make sure, yes, to make sure everyone is up to date, currently there is a mobile monitoring fleet collecting air quality data along approximately 300 linear miles of the east and west bank of the Mississippi River from East Baton Rouge Parish down to Plaquemine Parish. Got a vision of all that? The monitoring vehicles are equipped with sensors that are measuring PM 2.5, ozone, NO2, CO, carbon dioxide, black carbon, and screening for total VOCs. The data collected by the CARS is uploaded to the LDEQ website so that all the information produced by this project is publicly available. For anyone who does not have the link, we will post it in the chat. Thank you, Michael. Um, as the data is compiled, we're working to assess and analyze the results. This Zoom is just the beginning of the discussion. We want to make you understand this is a very a year-long project, so it's just the beginning. The mobile monitoring fleet will continue to monitor for two more months. The third month of the mobile monitoring will include an additional measurement for BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene. After the mobile monitoring is complete, we'll be establishing several stationary monitors to continue monitoring in areas where concerns are identified by the mobile monitoring. Today, we're excited to begin looking at the preliminary results of this monitoring together. Wilma and Dr. Slava will lead us in this discussion about where we, what we've seen so far. Dr. Slava, would you mind starting us off? And then Wilma, you'll be next. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I think I've uh, met before some of you. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows me. I'm a, a professor Please introduce at, yourself. Uh, at the, the Department of Environmental Sciences. And I've been lucky to be able to work with uh, Lean for some years now. Uh, and I did work before with Wilma oh, on different projects too. And uh, when Mary Lee told me about this project, I was mm -hmm. very excited, you know, and uh, happy to provide my uh, whatever help I can uh, to untangle uh, all those data. And with this uh, short introduction, I will uh, start my presentation. Okay, let's start with this. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So I have prepared a um, short presentation and so everybody can understand a little bit more about what kind of data is being collected. And from the first month of the collection, you know, maybe it's too much that we can draw some conclusions, but we can have some observation which can guide us, you know, where we should go next with it, you know, and what we should pay uh, more attention to. So, uh, first of all, this is the overall map, and I think uh, th this map was also shown on the email uh, uh, invitation, uh, but just so you understand that the extent of the project. So this is a, a, a very long route, you know, uh, on each side of the Mississippi River. And the special cars, you know, there are two cars driving and uh, oh, each of them has uh, special sen sensors. And this is the list of the sensors, what they're monitoring, which is PM 2.5 or other it's particular suspended in the air with the size of uh, 2.5 micrometers and smaller. And this is very specific size because it is uh, identified by EPA and by many researchers as the size range of particles that are inhalable. So this part, these particles can be inhaled and they can deposit in the human lungs in the upper respiratory system. That, that's why, 
That's why that's why oh, it is uh, um, uh, regulated, and this is very strictly regulated by EPA. What would the standard for the clean air is? Uh, what is the allowable limit? Ozone, of course, is another. It's a gas. Yeah. Uh, it's very dangerous and toxic gas. It's also very strictly regulated. Nitrogen dioxide is mostly associated with the combustion uh, production. Uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane uh, is less of an uh, impact for, for the human health, yeah. but uh, it, it's going to be used now and later on to monitor if there is any industrial leaks of methane or, or uh, and they have an impact in the environment in general. Black carbon, which, or you can say it's soot particles, right? Soot particles, of course, they, uh, they are also uh, quite dangerous and TVOCs or total volatile organic compounds. With that, I just wanted to um, everybody know that the sensors that is mounted, uh, it's not specific to what compound does it see. It's measures just all of the organic compounds that are present in the air and what it does it just reports this uh, method reports only if they see some elevations uh, local elevation of the concentration of the vocs comparing to the background right so it's not an absolute value it is how much above the background in some places uh, you can see the concentration of vocs and and the collection of VOCs require some more data points. We have not enough data about the VOCs even to talk about it yet. We need to wait a little bit longer until more data because of the way it's being collected. Uh, and then we can identify uh, spots uh, um, where there is a bigger risk of exposure. And this why that's why later on there will be the secondary car with additional monitors to more specifically look at those chemicals that uh, Merrily said, which is uh, benzene, toluene, and xylenes, uh, which are called in general leaks. So, um, with that, I just wanted to uh, highlight a few of the national ambient air quality standards, which are in, uh, enforced by EPA. And this is from the Clean Air Act, the allowable concentration of some of those um, gases that. The, our cars are monitoring and uh, specifically uh, I wanted to highlight uh, two things here is particulate particulates um, the, the golden standard is believed to be 12 micrograms per meter cube and this is an average over a one year it should not exceed that but in general uh, you can say that anything that's higher than 12 micrograms per meter cube, if you see such a concentration in your area, it's relatively dangerous. Uh, so you, you don't want it. Uh, ozone is um, also one of the gases that are uh, dangerous for older people and people with underlying health conditions. However, uh, because the uh, weather that we have right now, I don't anticipate the ozone to be exceeded because ozone formation is associated with the solar activity and hydrocarbons. So because we are in the winter season, the, there is much less sun. So uh, there is a, um, probably no, we're not going to see any exceedance of the ozone concentration during this uh, monitoring period. So uh, with just short, you know, introduction, this is our route right the route is to uh, divide it into two parts it's a northern route that goes uh, from baton rouge all the way i believe to uh it is sunshine sunshine bridge i believe right in in uh, uh this one here, it's a sunshine bridge and uh, so the cars are going the car is starting let's say in the morning and then going, you know, one side of the river and returns back the other side of the river. It's, it does it every single day since December 10. Uh, for the southern route, you know, it's from the same bridge. It's going all the way down to the Skull Terminal uh, on the Mississippi River. I forgot what's the name of the... Uh, 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 of the um, little town that's there, but it's marked on the map and, and we can see that. So data is collected every day. And when the car rides, the car doesn't stop. It rides all the time and it, co it is 
collecting uh, or measures all these pollutants every one second. So every second there is a recorded data and this we know because it's a moving car. So it's at the same time recording the GPS location, which then we can, you know, connect, you know, the location with time and uh, with the measured concentration. Uh, also, the drivers uh, have the schedule makeup like that, that they don't start always the same time of the day. So they so they can catch, you know, the uh, concentration of these different pollutants at different times of the day uh, in different places. And, and, and you will see in just a second uh, how it looks like. So this is an example. Uh, I wanted to show everybody how the data like this look like. So here in the first column is the timestamp, which is very accurate up to one second timestamp. There is also two additional columns that I don't show that's actually uh, latitude and longitude of the location at that time of the car when this data is taken, which is then, you know, uh, or otherwise GPS coordinates uh, for the location where the sample was taken. And here you have the measurement points that are, um, let's see if I can, I, I don't know if you see my cursor, uh, but so, but the data, you can say it's in columns with PM 2.5, black carbon ozone, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide and carbon dioxide. There is also a methane, but I don't show it here, methane, because it's a little bit less le relevant uh, to uh, what we're doing right now. And if you look at this timestamp, you can see that the uh, time is incrementing by one second, right? So you can see every one second here, there is a point, you know, and this particular set of, of data is for one area, right? And you can see that uh, every second the measurement is taken, you know, so it's actually December 12th uh, for one of the cars, you can see that it's driving and every second is taking, you know, the measurement in every point. And we can later do, and this is what I'm trying to do, is just looking at correlation of different gases to find out, you know, uh, what are the sources and try to connect it. But of course, it's a little bit too early to have any conclusions on that, but I just wanted you to show how it looks like. Uh, and as you, as you can imagine, if these cars are driving, let's say 18 hours a day, uh, there is, a, you can count how many seconds are there. So it is enormous amount of data and it takes a lot of time to process it. But at the same time, we need to have these cars run in the same place many times to have enough information or statistical information that we know that what they saw only one time, is it typical or it's just accidentally, is something was there, you know, measured accidentally. So that's why it takes a, a, about a month for get the first data collection. And uh, uh, because of the data is so big, so we starting to focus on, let's say one of the most, pollutants and uh, we selected so far particulates because they are so directly linked to so many health effects uh, for uh, for people. So we started first to look at them and we started to look at this. If, um, we're looking by uh, community by community because it's even impossible to process all the data at once. So we're working on a smaller selected areas and over time we're going to you know, go over all of those areas, but we can't do everything at once because there is uh, not even enough computing power to uh, uh, to do uh, all of that uh, at once. So uh, here is, uh, I wanted to show you this example for w one uh, location of how such a data looks like. So this is about for a very short uh, distance of a road, let's say, let's say about a mile. Uh, and you can see in this mile, there was already collected about uh, 7,500 7, points, right? So this is a lot of data points for only for PM 2.5. And here, you know, this graph shows you how these points lined up, you know, at different times when the car passes the same location uh, approximately at the same time. And it just creates this strings of the data points. On the uh, vertical scale, this is the concentration of the measured, measured PM 2.5, while on the... Um, 
uh, horizontal scale, this is time and at which it was measured. So I mark here in purple also, this is this EPA standard uh, uh, required by the Cleaner Act that I told you before about of two, uh, 12 micrograms per meter cube. So you can have a comparison that you see in, L in this particular place in uh, mm, a lot of data was below that limit, but at the same time, you see that the, there are uh, times and spots where the uh, this limit is exceeded, and in some cases it's exceeded significantly. This is just an example, just so you know how this data look like. And also uh, for the easiest of understanding and processing this, what we do from such a plot like you had just a second ago, we create a bigger time slots, right? So for example, typical for rush hour or something else that, and we can collect the, all those data <laughs> into one bucket and then look at it overall or more statistically, how many times is it higher than, than the limit or generally how this data with, with the specific uh, times uh, uh, are like the, uh, um, are observed. Oops, hold on a second. Uh, so you can see here in this graph that the same uh, plot that you had just a second ago, here it is already uh, kind of um, transformed into this time slots, bigger time slot and some statistic is performed, which gives you a mean and median values. Mean and median values are generally used by the regulating agencies. This is the, we can say, a, a kind of like an average value of concentration in, in a specific location, right? So uh, as, uh, also one important thing is this Q3. This is what is called uh, uh, the point at which 75% of all the data are within. And you can see that in one case here between 8 and 8.30, 8, this, this exceeds this 12 uh, uh, micrograms per meter cube uh, uh, the standard. Now, because uh, the averaging has this uh, property that it doesn't tell you how much of uh, time the um, uh, concentration is exceeded uh, against the uh, uh, clean air standard right so and and so to to pass that point a little bit and i didn't want it to look at it in the same way as as the agency are looking because you know when you look an average you don't see if it's quite often or not often exceeding uh, the uh, clean air so what we are so looking is uh, how many times in a percentage wise uh, from all the data points, how many uh, percent of the data actually exceeds the standard? And you can see that for this particular section that I'm showing you here, 6% of the time uh, it exceeds this standard, which means you can uh, uh, calculate it, for example, based on 24 hours, the 6%, how many hours it would be, and you can extend it overall that, you know, uh, uh, about one and a half hour during the 24 hour period, this concentration is higher in this area, right? You can uh, kind of extrapolate it like this, which is not very desirable. So here is the first uh, four communities that we looked we'll at. Take your uniform course... off, let's be first to go to the game. Excuse me? Miss Ashley, you're not muted, so you're telling somebody to go, get dressed to go to the game. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, I I'm thought like, it was it's funny. okay. Just mute your <laughs> your lines unless you want to talk to us. Okay. No, Thanks. Sorry. Um, no, no problem. No, that's, that's fine. I think you were asking some question, and of course, if if you want to ask a question, I don't mind. You can jump in and ask a question anytime. Uh, so. Uh, we started with these four communities, and this is an ongoing process. And Marilee knows how it is. You know, once I finish one section, I send her some summary about this section. And because there is so much data, you know, to process, it just takes time. About one area like this takes about a, a week uh, to process the data and to uh, have a look like this. And these are the first four communities that we looked at. Uh, so they are marked here in the map. And this is um uh, St. Gabriel area this is uh, Geismar area so this is this going from north to south along the river so it's uh, St. Gabriel Geismar 
St. James area and reserve area. So these are the uh, first four that we looked, and we're gonna, of course, fill it in and, and add more and more as times goes on. This is also very important to keep in mind. This is the windrows, which means this shows you what is the predominant wind direction during the time that the samples were being collected. It is important because the, uh, especially when you're talking about the particulates, particulates from the emission source, they usually do not fall immediately on the ground. They are being transported a little bit of that. And that's why it's very important to look which way the wind blows. And I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody knows that, you know, that if you smell something from somewhere, you know, it's you need to be down the wind to smell it very well, not up the wind, right? Because up the wind, nothing will show up. So uh, it is also quite interesting because uh, originally, uh, when it when we Mary Lee and Michael were planning it, it was supposed to start in summer, for not because of uh, lean fault. You know, the project was delayed a little bit, and it's in winter and. The wind direction is a little bit different than what was anticipated originally, because in summer, uh, the wind direction predominant is from southwest. Right now, it's kind of from the opposite direction is from the northeast. Uh, so this is the first um, uh, data that I wanted to show, and this is San Gabriel area. And again, we, uh, we divided the San Gabriel area on both sides of the river into a smaller sections because it's then easier a little bit to analyze the data. If you take the entire area and just average it, you will just have a one big average value. We wanted to look in a smaller sections and see that here, for example, in this section, it's more of a problem. In this section is less of a problem and so on and so on. And we can also look then uh, if there maybe is potentially some one common source for this particulate that is blowing it into the uh, places where people live and we can try to identify it. So uh, we divided this area into the map segments from A1 to A9. And this is a summary table that shows you in each section, uh, map se section, uh, how many data points is in each section. So you can see it anywhere from um, around 10,000 points to about 5,000 points per section. And I also looked at it, you know, for what is most interesting for us is how many times percentage wise, this sec in this section, this national ambient air quality standards for PM2.5 were exceeded. So, and from that, you can immediately identify places where it is uh, more times that's being exceeded. For example, like this area here and the area um, uh, uh, here, just above it, right? That this is, you know, 8% of time, which is a nine, which is when it's getting too close to four, uh, ten percent. It means you know over twenty-four hour period, the two and a half hours would be a much higher concentration uh, that it uh, would be normally allowed. I also wanted to show you uh, because I think uh, later on Mary Lee is uh, gonna uh, post these maps that we created on the Lean website. So I here on this presentation there is a link, and I wanted to show you how this map looks like. Actually, anybody will be able to go on that map and look exactly, you know, what is being measured. And you can zoom in, for example. Uh, so I'm going to zoom in, you know, very, very close. Okay. So here is, let's say, Highway 75. And I even can put it, this uh, map, in a uh, background that shows buildings, right? So you can, somebody, let's say, lives here in this building, they can, you know, zoom it in and see every single data point that was measured. And when you click at this data point, it shows you what concentration of this PM 2.5 was measured at this data point. And, you know, they can see, for example, the how many red dots and how often the red dots comparing to green and yellow dots are showing up. And these uh, colors are associated with this scale. So uh, 12 is the limit uh, imposed by the 
a national ambient air quality standard, so everything is red, you know, whatever is above 12. When you're getting closer to 12, it doesn't mean it's healthy. It's still elevated concentration. So that's why it's from seven uh, graded from yellow to red and you know what's below seven let's say it's less of a concern and you can when you go on this maps you can also just and i just wanted to show you not only that you can also turn off or turn off specific segments like you see here if you want to only look at the segment at which you live you can turn off all the other segments and just leave one segment that that you you know want to look at but uh, so uh, this is for something i think you know very shortly whatever we've done so far it's going to be posted on the link post it has also a link in this presentation to each of the map uh, uh, here so i don't know if uh, merely you're going to want to distribute or not, but uh, or posted the entire presentation there. Yes, and also uh, we're going to be posting this presentation to YouTube, so okay. people can go to YouTube and and listen to this. I hope everyone who's been doing this for a long time understands to me how transformative this car and mobile monitoring is compared to way back in the day, right, Wilma? And yes. you know, it just it's it's amazing. So, um, thank you, Doctor Slavo. I, I'm not finished yet. No. I know. I'm just. I'm just thanking you for what you're doing so far. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, let's go to the next page, and here we can lo look at these distributions exactly like we were showing before with these time slots, uh, and uh, you can see that you know in in at some hours there is a much higher concentration. Uh, they are called here as a extreme outliers. And this is what I wanted to show to everybody that when you measure just an average, doesn't give you the entire picture because it, usually the averages, they don't catch, this, catch these higher values uh, that are uh, presented there. Uh, so uh, if you also look at this map, you know, so th there is some industrial activity and you can see here that, for example, uh, the areas that are elevated A4, they, they because of the wind direction the wind direction is going to blow from the north from the northeast so this is potentially the all the particulates that are measured here in this area are coming from from somewhere from here right so they are being transported as with air and collected same is for this a6 area uh, which is has seven percent, relatively high. So here are, I believe, two or three plants. Here it's Gentec, the Chinese plant, and there is something else also there, right? So the wind blows this direction, so you won't see this elevated concentration potentially are associated with this over there, but it's gonna be over here, and this is where we actually do. Uh, see it, you know, the way we would expect if it's coming from somewhere here, you know, on this A6. So th this is just for a short explanation how these uh, particulates and plumes will travel and how, where we can expect to see them. And this is kind of indication that we do see it this way. Same here, this A8 area, it, it might be even coming from the Mississippi River if there is, you know, some big uh, ships coming on with the emissions from their uh, uh, diesel engine, huge diesel engine, you know, they're going to emit a lot of particulates. Uh, so this is uh, for each of those sections. So uh, you can see, uh, for example, this A9 area, you can see that the overall there was a big elevation here above the 12 limit. Uh, uh, even the median is close to uh, 10. The next area that we looked at is the Geismar area. And in Geismar area, the situation, while in San Gabriel, relative to the particulates, it, it, it exceeds, you know, in places around 10%. In the Geismar area, it's even worse. Uh, you can see it that, uh, again, these are these different sections, and there are areas that the uh, exceedance is almost 20% like B3 area here. Uh, I believe there is some plant here. I think it's a refinery or something. I am not uh, absolutely sure uh, right now. 
uh, which one it is, but there is uh, some facility over there. And when the wind blows from uh, east and northeast, it blows everything you know this way. And you can see this B1, B2, and B3, very high concentration, sometimes even B4, which is this road here, it's mostly associated with this one here in the this exceedance with the one here uh, on this side. Uh, the, the emissions from this area is even so big that it transport all the way through the Mississippi River. And you can even see it on the other side of the Mississippi River. And I don't believe that this road here would have a very heavy traffic because just it's just a circular road around the um, uh, around the river bend. So there is not very heavy traffic over there. Most of the traffic goes straight, this road that's going here. Uh, but it's still, you know, this the pollution from the other side of the river is being transported. What's uh, also quite interesting that if you uh, look the other way, uh, for example, B6 is I-10. So if you will have a high traffic, you will see, you know, something like here on the I-10, there is a lot of cars and it's much lower accidents on the I-10. And B5 on the other side of this is also lower. So it kind of follows the uh, wind direction uh, from this area that just blows this way. And again, here, and well, this is the this time distributions for um, different emissions. Uh, and you can see uh, that they are not typical, like you have a rush hour in the morning. They are actually rather more afternoon or evening or something. This is very interesting and unusual, uh, which would uh, even... Uh, high emissions, you know, late at night between 8 and 11 p.m., right? You can see here, this is something very uh, uh, unusual. Uh, all the way up to 400 micrograms per meter cube, which is a very high concentration. And this is uh, same uh, B8, which is on the other side of the river. And you can see the pattern that it, this pattern of this late in the day, this higher emission transfer to all to all the way to the other side of the river, right? It's, it's being transported to there. It's less often, but it's still present there. Um, oops, I think I jumped that one. So now we're going to uh, St. James area. And with the St. James area, uh, so far we have a little bit problem in the sense of the wind direction. Because you know most of the industry is actually on this side of the river, and the southwest winds will blow it, you know, to the other side, to the St. James area. Well, now we have a wind blowing into the other directions, and we did not catch uh, much of these particulates. It looks um, when it's somewhere around four percent. I would say it's something more associated to a. a usual traffic, uh, if there is uh, any traffic, and you can see this, these numbers here at this time of the year are much lower uh, compared that it could have been if the wind would be blowing the other direction. And again, here also, you know, you can still see sometimes, uh, but here you can see this pattern is more like rush hour, uh, about 6 to 8.30, which would mean that this may be the one that we see here right now is more of a traffic uh, related uh, emissions. And Dr. Slavo, can I add something? Yes. Uh, because of the uh, looking at this data, we've actually changed the route in right. that area. Mm -hmm. You might want to address that because we realize- Yes, and I, ha I have a something at the end of the presentation okay. about that, okay. uh, that the, after, you know, looking at this preliminary data, we have contacted the Aklima, the company that has the cars, that they adjust the route, you know, they, they move it in this area to the uh, southern route. Let me show you on the map here that is that they go over this road that's here south. So we can actually look at it, what's the emission. Essentially, what we will be doing is we're going to be looking how the emissions looks like typically uh, 
Oh, the only change would be that in the summer, when the wind will blow the other direction, the same emissions and the same concentration we'll see on the other side of the river because the wind will blow on the opposite direction. And this is what they, uh, I believe, collecting right now, they started to change the route and go the southern route here. Thank you, doctor. <clears throat> And this is uh, another area of a concern. It's a reserve area. And again, here, uh, you, you can see that uh, particularly high emissions we did observe uh, on the uh, northern uh, bank of the river. Uh, here, the maps D3 and D4. Uh, so this is close to the... Um, uh, uh, plants that are present there. I believe it's a marathon plant, if I'm not wrong. The marathon plant is uh, located he somewhere here. And there is a much uh, uh, higher concentration of particulates associated with it. Even more so, these particulates are being blown because the uh, river is uh, not enough to uh, uh, stop uh, uh, this particulates, they blow onto the other side to D6 and D7, which is, you can see uh, D5, D6, and D7. So the, the particulates are being blown to the other side of the river. Um, this indicates, you know, to me that, that, that there is a potential, a big source of particulates somewhere here. And especially this D3, I wanted to show you D3 is located here, right? This is this area. You can see that uh, uh something happened here i'm missing there you go i had to even change the scale uh, because at some point the particulates were so big you can see it's about 1500 micrograms per meter cube uh, uh, at moments which is extremely high concentration i'm not saying it's always like this but there are you know moments that uh, uh, it notice you know for a few measurements it go uh, as high as that. I don't know why it disappears. Okay. Uh, and I had later to expand scale back more to the original one, just to show again that in the late hours, this is kind of similar pattern. We see here this high concentrations. And if we go on the other side of the ri river, uh, which was here, this was D5, D6. You can uh, see these concentrations also uh especially this bar here move this you can see that the, the entire box is above the, the national ambient air quality standards for the late hours right you can see it's all the way up here and the same here the five and the six and so this is again very similar pattern and uh, uh, uh this is for the rest of the area and this is just a short review of what we have found so far. Uh, just to summarize it, uh, we, we are very uh, concerned that in some location there is a significant elevation of this particulates. As like, like I said, it's not everywhere. Uh, we, in some places we were surprised, and that's why we adjusted the route, for example, in St. James Parish, uh, that you know they were relatively low. Uh, uh, in, for example, in the uh, Geismar area, I looked at some places in the Mississippi River Bridge where, you know, we have a constant traffic blockage, you know, all these trucks are standing on the Mississippi River Bridge and the level of the Geismar pollution is similar like you would be sitting on the bridge all the time. So uh, uh, th this is uh, quite uh, concerning. Uh, we believe this may indicate some correlation with industrial activity, and uh, I'm working right now just to try to figure it out, you know, uh, uh, some uh, correlations, and when we call it a fingerprinting, if it can be uh, decisively identified that these elevated concentrations of particulates in some places are associated with some industrial uh, activities, or is it maybe a high traffic uh, associated with the industry that's present there, right? Because it's also possible that may, the, you know, big diesel trucks that are driving there all the time, they may spewing, you know, a lot of pollutants. And like uh, we said, we also adjusting the routes uh, right now uh, because of the uh, 
unusual wind direction that we are observing right now. And I, I, at the end, I just wanted to mention one more thing, you know, that um, the weather right now is even not very cooperative because we have a lot of rain and rain tends to wash out the pollutants from the air. So the air is generally cleaner than it would be if it would be would would not be raining. Uh, so uh, this is something that I wanted to add at the end. And this is all from me. And I hope I didn't take too much time of you guys. Thank you, Dr. Slavo. If anybody has a question for Dr. Slavo or we want to go into Wilma and then have questions. Let's move on and I'll ask questions so I can catch all of it. Okay, great. Well, I, have I have a question. Okay. Hello? Yes, yes sir, Mr. Grace. Yeah. How long will you, uh, will you continue to do this, doctor? Well, I'm going to continue doing it as long as we have data to analyze. Okay. Now, uh, these cars, uh, where are you anchoring those cars at night or in a particular place? Yes, they are in a secured location. One is in Baton Rouge, one set is in Baton Rouge, one set is in New Orleans. Right. Okay. And uh, the San Gabriel area, you covered the whole entire area, the Bayou Paul area as well? Well, I, I can only cover the area that's on the route of the cars, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, like like you see here, right? And uh, so later on, you know, when it will be posted, you can click this uh, this uh, direction rows uh, sign. It has a link to the uh, live map. You see the, the sign mm -hmm. here on the bottom. It has a link that will take you to the map of the area. And you can look, you know, zoom in and look at every point on the route, you know, how it looked like. Okay. We are limited, of course, only on uh, on the uh, route of the cars and car cannot go everywhere mm -hmm. because there will be no time. You know, it, it takes a long time to drive, you know, all the way up and down the river. But the plan is once we identify some trouble spots, uh, Lean is planning to put the... Uh, um, mobile stationary uh, uh, sampling devices that we can monitor and you can, we, you know, we put it in one place for a month or two months then move it to another place for a few months. Okay, so, very good, very good. Now, the reason I'm asking that because some of St. Gabriel is, is in, unincorporated. It is, a, you know, it's not within the city limits. So I was just wondering how you, did you attack the, uh, monitor the- uh, Well, us? when I say, San Gabriel, I didn't mean the city of San Gabriel. I'm saying this is generally San Gabriel area. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. We didn't, we didn't leave any, anything out, Reginald. Okay. And um, by the way, these are locally hired drivers, and the only day that they've had off was Christmas. What? <laughs> yes. And sleep. Uh, yeah, and sleep. They get to sleep. <laughs> and uh, so thank you, Dr. Slavo, so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the great question too, Reginald. You're welcome. Wilma, you ready? Yes. All right, thank you. So first, let me tell you about this. I had cancer on my skin and I had it taken off Monday and he warned me I was gonna have a black eye. He didn't warn me I was gonna have a red eye. But I have to go back in two weeks. Everything is fine. He got it all out before he stitched me up. But it, the it, second makes you, thing, Wilma, it makes you even look like a bigger fighter than you are. I think so, too. Who are we going to blame this on, Wilma? Just kidding. You look great, and I'm glad it turned out okay. Don't worry about your eye. Yeah. The second thing is that I'm going to focus more on the community aspects. But I just want you to know that usually I have either handouts or up on the screen and Mary Lee only engaged me a couple of days ago in this project. So I've been doing another project at the same time with the Wall Street Journal, and I've been working on this night and day since she engaged me a couple of days ago. So I don't have anything to hand out to you. But from a community perspective, when you talk about the cars driving down the road, they do the east and west banks of the Mississippi River, which Slavo showed you. 
and they measure everything within 300 meters. And once they get 300 meters, that data is all together, and then they do the next 300, the next 300, and the next 300. So what I am encouraging you to do is to know your segment, and it's called segment, and you know the number of your segment, and that segment has to be where you live, where your children go to school, where you go to church, where you go shopping, all the segments that you occupy time in those segments so you can find out what chemicals and what concentrations are occurring in those segments. So the issue is if you live in it, if you work in it, if you attend school, if you worship in it, if you shop in it, or your relatives live in the other one, you need to be watching what's going on in those segments. And to determine your exposure to those air emissions in those segments. Also, which industrial facilities are located on or near those segments. Now, I know you know the industrial facilities because most of you are fighting the industrial facilities, but you have to be able to correlate you already know, for the most part, what chemicals are being released by your industrial facility. And you heard from Slavo what chemicals are being tested for by the car. And so you need to sort of pay attention. Are those chemicals coming from an industrial facility in your segment or maybe in a segment adjacent to you or maybe in a segment across the river? But it's important that you're paying attention to your segments that you occupy time in. So let's talk about the parameters that Slavo showed you. He talked about ozone. It's a reactive gas. And it if you inhale it, it damages the lungs, the respiratory system. It causes you to cough. It causes you shortness of breath. It gives you a throat irritation. So whenever you see that coming up in your segment or on Slavo's plots, you know you were exposed to ozone and you might have had those health impacts. So beginning the first week of January is when they started and they're going to be doing it for three months. And the third month we'll talk about in just a minute. So when we look at the ozone from the data he had, has and at the beginning he showed you that chart with just tons of numbers on it and that gives you the information from your segment but i reviewed all that data and the values in the ozone were in the 20s the 30s and the 40 parts per billion and the highest values were 47 parts per billion so we need to look at what's going on around your segment and where it might have been coming from to give that highest number. The lowest value was 0 0.4. So 0 0.4 looks like on a normal day and 47 looks like a real exposure day. So you need to determine the source of those elevated ozone values. The second one he talked about was NO2, nitrogen dioxide. That one irritates and burns the skin, your eyes, with possible eye damage. It irritates your nose and your throat. It irritates your lungs. It causes coughing and it causes shortness of breath. So chronic or long-term exposure limits, they have limited evidence that says it may damage a developing fetus. So if you have a daughter or a daughter-in-law or granddaughter that is pregnant, they should not be allowed to be in those areas because it may damage their fetus. And just remember the data from Reserve. The facility there has been judged by EPA that if you have a baby or if you're pregnant, when that baby reaches a second year birthday, it has 70 years of exposure. And always you look at, 
if someone has 70 years exposure, it's a lifetime. But those babies have 70 years in two years. And it's important to also be looking at the data that Slavo is putting out for the exposure to not only the baby, but to the mother. Then we have NO2 parts per billion, nitrogen dioxide. They had lots of 20s, 30s, and they had just a few 40s. The highest one was 48. So you'd really look more in the 40s and see if you have it in your segment are the segments around you. And you need to check the industrial facilities that may be releasing that either in your neighborhood or across the river. Then the other one is carbon monoxide. It causes inhalation, head headaches, dizziness, lightheadedness, and fatigue. The highest air concentration was 3.8. The elevated was in one, two, and three, so you need to check the individuals in your segment. The next one is carbon dioxide, CO2. It can irritate and burn the skin and the eyes, causing headaches, dizziness, and difficulty breathing. And it may cause spontaneous abortion. So once again, look out for the women who are pregnant. The air monitoring for CO2 was in the 300 and 400 parts per million range. There were a number of them in the 500 parts per million. So you need to check the industry facilities and see what chemicals they were releasing in that area. And then there's black carbon. And the black carbon is associated with asthma, respiratory, and it does carbon dioxide vehicles. And so you need to ask Slavo if the car is emitting some of these emissions out this, this tailpipe. And then you need to be sure that you're not being exposed and you may have some of these health impacts. And, it, and then it causes coughing, irritation to the eyes, nose, and throat. The black carbon may lodge in your lungs and once it lodges in your lungs, then you have a whole host of other issues. It's down there. It doesn't come out. You can't just cough it up and make it go away. And the air value was the lowest one was 0.61. And then there were plenty of values in two, three, four, and five. And then you need to check the industrial facilities and see if some of those chemicals were coming from the industrial facility. And then there are volatile organics, and Slavo mentioned that. And they are going to be done in the third month. And so they're not being done now, but they will be there in the third month. And there are four components. Benzene. Benzene is a known human cancer-causing agent. It also irritates the skin, eyes, nose, and throat. And it's a carcinogen. It causes leukemia. Then the second volatile is toluene. It may be a teratogen in humans. It malfunction of the fetus. It irritates your eyes, skin, nose, and throat, causes coughing, wheezing, headaches, and dizziness. And then ethylbenzene's the next one. It irritates the skin, the nose, the throat. It causes headaches, dizziness. It may be a carcinogen cancer of the kidneys, testes, lungs, liver, and animals, and it may cause the same thing in humans. And then the last one is xylene, and it irritates your skin, eyes, nose, throat, causes coughing, wheezing. Xylene may damage developing fetus. Then you need to look at a scope of work that does not require community members to report the impacts, but you can report to DEQ odors, and you can report to DEQ health impacts. And I would encourage the community members to record the date, the time, the location, and the human impacts you're having, as well as what it smell like. And then you need to call in the single point of contact with DEQ. And the phone number is 225-219-3640. And report your symptoms, what you smelled, and you can do it anonymously if you so choose, or you can use your name. And you give them the information to DEQ of where you were located when you smelled it and where you had those health impacts. 
And then we'll be able to match all of this with the data that Slavo's pulling together. And these incidents that the industry reports, they are called incidents and they may have a big release out of a tank. They may have a flare. They may have something that occurred on the river from one of their ships or one of their boats or a particular unit that causes really high concentrations and they have to report that to DEQ. So we'll be able to see if we can match industry incidents to your reporting of odors and health impacts. We will correlate the chemicals released into the environment, into the air, water, soil, sediment by the industrial facility, by businesses, by boats, by ships. And with that, we'll match the chemicals that were detected by the cars, as well as air monitoring equipment. And then the emission data will also be correlated to negative health impacts experienced by you, the community. So we will be able to determine cause and effect and work towards improving the air quality along Cancer Alley. We may also be able to identify the sources of these chemicals being released that are not included in their permits. So we may be able to add additional chemicals to their permit if we identify them and they're not included in their permit. And those are all regulations that are required for them to report what they're releasing. And by monitoring, which Slavo is doing the data from those cars, and by you reporting to DEQ if you have odors that you observe and health impacts, we will be able to pull all those pieces together, have cause and effect, and perhaps clean up the air on Cancer Alley. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Wilma. Does anybody have any questions? Mary saying no, Mary Hampton saying no. If I may chime in for a second. Hey, oh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Wilma. Hey, Ms. Mary, I barely, something went with the volume. It went down a lot. Um, I did have a question. When you're looking at that map, when we get access to it, I noticed that it did track St. James and um, St. Gabriel and all. So we'll cross the river from St. Gabriel and up the road from St. James, and I did see Modes on the map. Um, we'll... Like CF is close to us, and I know it's not considered a petrochemical plant. Will I be able to track the chemicals that's in the air on the route that they took to Mo to get to Modes? Yes, any place that the car goes, you'll be able to see everything. Okay. Yeah, yeah Ashley, for sure. I'm sorry, Dr. Slavo, you too had something to add? I, I, I just wanted to add, you know, thank you, Wilma, because this was a great presentation uh, of the potential health effect of this uh, different uh, uh, pollutants that we are measuring. I, I, I just wanted to um, to mention that the, the, the effects, the most serious one, are usually associated with the high doses and high concentrations. And I don't want you to get too scared, you know, <laughs> about that, that you are instantly going to die or something, uh, because the health effects are typically associated with the uh, different type of concentrations uh, that you're looking at. And I would refer you to the table that I had at the beginning of the uh, my presentation, that there were national ambient air quality standards by DEQ, uh, sorry, by EPA, that are defining, you know, which levels should not be exceeded in the air for for ozone, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and, um, and well, carbon dioxide is a different story because the average concentration in the world of the carbon dioxide is about four hundred ppm right now. Did you mean to have your camera off, Doctor Slavo? Just oh, ask. sorry, <laughs> I turned it off. <laughs> It's okay. I, I thought when you're talking, you would. I'm you. sorry. I turned it off. You know, when I was not uh, when I finished my presentation and what, what, didn't want it to distract anyone. But no uh, problem. It's just a, a small comment. I don't want everybody to get too scared because the effects that William mentioned there they are true. 
you know, if you have a long exposure, you know, to things like that, you know, and overall when it accumulates. Thank you, Dr. Slavo. Um, any other questions from anyone or um, this is just, I just want to reiterate while you're thinking about it, this is just the beginning of a long-term project for us. So we're excited about it. We hope you are too. We're working to get verifiable data. That's why we're not, we're just sharing with you what we're seeing. And um, we've got folks analyzing, as you can see. So um, we're excited. And don't worry, Lisa, we haven't forgotten you. They're going by you as well. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I, 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 I'm sitting here almost teary eyed because um, this is so amazing what you all are doing. And I really appreciate this presentation. So um, it's so important. It is such good work. It is just amazing. And I just want to thank you all. I really appreciate you explaining this. I mean, this has made it so much more understandable. And um, just thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And we're going to be doing your area like Dr. Slavo has, you know, making a map Probably in your within area. Next, within the next two weeks. In the next two weeks, Lisa. So um, I, I'm like you, I get teary eyed because for me, it's been a lifetime to find this kind of technology that communities could have. You know, oh. other folks have this have had this kind right. of um, access to data before. This is the first time that I know of that we're actually able no, to no. Have it, Exactly, Mary Lee. This is, you can't argue with this. You can't say, you know, oh, um, you know, your, I don't know, concerns are not valid. I mean, you, you can't argue with data, really good data like this. And this is so precise. And it is so, I mean, the fact that you're not just doing it once. I mean, I just can go on and on about just how incredibly valuable this is. And I just, again, I just want to thank you. Thank you all. And this was oh, a great Lisa, presentation. We love you. I mean, we this, love all this of you. is so good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, Reginald, thank you. I mean, this this has literally been years to make this happen, and a lot of um, a lot of patience to get it started. So um, I, I I know all of y'all have been in this for a long time. Understand how much work it took to get to this point, but we are here. And there were some some times that doubted that we would be at this point, but we are, and we're moving forward, and we're getting, as you said, Lisa and Reginald chiming in there as well, some good data. Um, that, you know, to me, it's astonishing. I call them Harry Potter cars because uh, I'm not as technical as Will and Dr. Slavo. And, uh, but it's actually, we have four cars on the ground, two, two, and then we have, we'll have the BTEX and we actually have a spare car in case something breaks down. So we hope we thought of everything. We feel really good. Also, it's an independent contractor. This is, no one can say, oh, Mary Hampton had that or Reginald Grace had that or the other Grace had that, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So um, I think this could be, it will be very powerful and we really appreciate your support. And um, we really care about what's happening and we're trying to, to make change in this space. Ronald I Grace just, wants to know it. how long the monitoring occurs each day. He wants to know if it's occurring all the way to 18 hours. I believe it. They, 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 there are per one round. There are two drivers, so they are taking shifts and they driving approximately eighteen hours a day. Mm -hmm. They get very little breaks too, um, but so they're one driver. Let's say I don't remember exactly how they split it, but they just just change. You know what? So one northern round is shared by two drivers. They just, you know, one finishes, the next one starts up with a small breaks in between, and then the other. So they are driving constantly, unless there are some, uh, unex sorry, I turn off my camera again. Un <laughs> unless there are some unexpected events, like there was the sleet, you know, for two days, you know, the roads were closed, so they could not drive. Yes, and, and just for everyone to know, because... We're a fair, equitable organization. They're getting a really good compensation for their driving. And so I think for a lot of people, it's been bless a blessing for them to be able to do that. They understand the importance of what they're doing and they're being compensated properly. So um, we feel good about that. That is the contractor's uh, business, but they they share it with us. So um, we appreciate I, this. Anything, I just wanted else? to mention one thing at the end that you know it's kudos to Mary Lee and to Michael who wrote this grant to EPA and EPA funded their proposal to to have this done. 
Thank you, Dr. Slavo. It, it, it's well worth it. This is the, this. Uh, yes, to me, it's been a dream. I'm like, Lisa, I could get emotional about it for sure. But thank you, everyone. I'm going to look forward to seeing you again on Zoom. Also contact us directly as we move um, down the river or up the river, depending on which way you're looking at it. Um, we'll be letting you know what we find. Sounds good? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It was such a blessing.